Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Health Via Modern Nutrition h Women Podcast. This is your host, Jeffrey Wu. And I'm super excited to bring on Dr. Ken Berry. I've seen and followed his work over the years, and he's definitely one of the more vocal and uh, followed personalities, if we call nutrition doctor as personalities in, in, in this day and age on social media, talking about low carbohydrate, ketogenic approaches towards metabolic health. So Dr. Ken Berry, great to have you on the program. Thanks for, for having me. It's good to talk with you. Yeah. So where to, where to begin? I mean, I think one of the funny aspects of, I would say, social media and with doctors, scientists, hobbyists, enthusiasts, bringing and talking about nutrition into, into social media, it's, it's become kind of a fun, interactive, do, you know, kind of a, 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 like a free for all battle in terms of ad hominem and, and all of that. So curious to hear your story in terms of your background as a practicing medical doctor and how you got into the nutrition game, the nutrition personality game. Sure. So I'm a family physician and have been practicing for 20 years a little bit over 20 years. And uh, during the entirety of that time, I've always been very interested in biohacking and in life extension. Those those have always been very compelling hypotheses that we could do things to improve our health and do things to extend both our lifespan and our health span. Uh, But a few years into my medical practice, I started to get fat And uh, by about 35 years of age, I really started packing on fat and I became pre-diabetic. I had severe heartburn. I had rosacea. I had arthritis pain, uh, just everything you can name. Every joint in my body ached in the mornings when I got up. And so during all this time, I was trying all these different biohacks and playing with this and taking a month of pregnenolone, then a month of, uh, you know, some nootropic and just always playing with these little hacks. But I was just getting sicker and sicker. And, and so it occurred to me when I became pre-diabetic, because I would, I would check my lab work every six months because I was right there at the clinic. It was easy to do. And when I became pre-diabetic, I was like, man, there must be some foundational thing that I'm missing, some root cause, you know? And so it's got to be, I mean, I'm, I was fairly active. You know, I had kids. I was running around in the yard playing wasn't like I was completely sedentary, but I was just getting fatter and fatter. And so I thought, well, it's got to be my nutrition, right? I've got to be doing something wrong in the nutrition sphere of health. And so I, I got all my med school notes down out of the attic from my nutrition class. And, you know, you might be you might be visualizing me carrying these huge tomes down the attic steps. In reality, it was a paperback book that was about three eighths of an inch thick. And then about a quarter inch thick of of notes that we had taken during the half semester course in nutrition. We had our second year of med school. So it was very minuscule. Now, we were trained very well on the feeding of someone who had had third degree burns over 60 percent of their body and they were in the burn unit. We were really good at providing enough nutrition for that person so they would heal and not become malnourished. If you'd been in a rollover MVA and you were unconscious in the ICU for two months, we were trained very well how to how to keep you from starving, how to keep you from developing uh, decubitus ulcers and nutritional deficiencies with parental nu- nutrition. But what we were not trained at all in was the care and feeding of just a normal human out in the normal human wilderness, which is civilization, right? And so I can sum up the entirety of my med school education about the feeding of just a regular human animal in three statements, eat lots of whole grain, avoid all saturated fat, and jog. That was literally the depth of my nutrition education. And so when it came to nutrition for specific pathologies, we got pretty good education on that. But when it came to just preventive nutrition and life extension and health span extension nutrition, we didn't get any of that at all. And so I had to start looking outside of my medical box for other sources of nutrition hypotheses, right? Because we don't, none of this stuff is proven. And, and so I found the Atkins diet revolution, Mark Sisson's primal blueprint, Lauren Cordain's paleo diet. And I was like, wow, everything they say is exactly backwards to what I was taught. But I mean, these, these guys look pretty healthy and it seems like a lot of people are having good success. 
with their hypothesis. So I thought, well, I'm going to just implement a much lower carb, get rid of all the grains, get rid of the sugar, and just basically eat lots of meat and veg. And immediately I started to get better. I started to, to lose body fat. My hemoglobin A1C went back to normal. I, and so uh, that's good, right? Because having an elevated A1C is a risk factor for basically every known cause of death in the universe. My rosacea started to get better and my, my joint pain, I tore an ACL between high school and college basketball in that, that summer and ruined my college career. But in the long run, it probably worked out okay. But that knee always tweaked and ached and hurt and was stiff in the mornings. That went away. And I was like, that's weird. How, how's that possible? I mean, and so I chalked it all up to, oh, I'm just losing. I'm, I'm lighter. So it's not as much trauma on that knee joint, right? Turns out that was a false hypothesis. That's not actually how my knee got better. It got better uh, specifically in several other pathways, but but just being lighter on my feet was not one of those pathways. And so then I started to apply this low carb, much higher saturated fat diet. I started to recommend it to my most morbidly obese patients, people who had a BMI uh, of 35 or above. These people were on the waiting list for bariatric surgery. They were going to get a Rowan Y or some kind of gastric bypass procedure. And I said, hey, you know, you got three months before your surgery. You should try this diet. I mean, it's really, you get to eat all the bacon you want. Boom. And you can put butter on all your vegetables and they're like, okay, whatever, I'll try it. And so these people would come back three months later and be like, dude, I've lost 65 pounds and my heart burns better and my Joint pain is better and everything's better. And so I'm like, that's so weird because at that time, way back then, I considered a keto diet, a very low carb diet. I considered it a short term hack just for weight loss. I I didn't know any of the far reaching implications of eating a proper human diet, which is what I consider a very low carb diet filled with real whole one ingredient foods. I consider that now to be the proper human diet. And and so what, what all my patients and, and I, what we were experiencing was a removal of the slow poisons that are so prevalent in the modern diet. And, and so when you're poisoning any mammal, they, they get sluggish, lethargic. They're not happy. They won't play. They won't chase their ball. They, they don't want to have sex. Their, their, their skin, their hair, their, their vision, everything gets dull and, and blah. But when you stop poisoning that mammal, almost as if by magic, that mammal starts to get better and they'll chase their ball again and they'll, they'll want to, you know, have sex with the neighbor animal and they, they sleep better and they just have more energy and vigor and they actually have a positive. They want to go out and run around in the, the pasture or whatever. And nothing magic happened there. That, that wasn't magic. You just stopped poisoning the mammal. And so it slowly dawned on me that that's what my patients and I, that was all the benefits from this weight loss hack diet that I was recommending to them. We were basically removing all the slow poisons from modern diet and just eating real human food. And when we did that, all of these other maladies started to just uh, get better or go completely away. And it was at that point when I thought, you know, this is a big deal. This is not just a weight loss issue here. Definitely, it helps with that better than anything I've ever found. But when a diet starts to reverse and, and, and improve osteoarthritis and gastroesophageal reflux and rosacea and eczema and psoriasis and depression, I mean, that's huge. There's something you're doing there. And so that's why I really have went down this rabbit hole and, and still going full speed today, because I think that together, all of us, you, me, everybody in this space, what we're doing, if you if you were able to pull back to the 50,000 foot level and look down, what are these knuckleheads doing? We're basically stumbling around and rediscovering the proper human diet spectrum. That's what we're doing. And when a human being eats on this spectrum, Health is the default. Disease is not the default. Health is the, is the default. But when you're slow poisoning all these humans, then disease and fatigue and depression, those are the defaults. But it's not that way when you feed a mammal a species-specific diet. And I think that's what we're all uncovering and rediscovering here. And so it's a very, it's very new technology what we're doing, but it's actually very ancient technology. And so it's almost like we're rediscovering the ancient technology of some, you know, uh, foreign civilization, like, oh, no, this is how you're supposed to do it. And so it, it, it's like a daily discovery. 
But we really can't take credit because humans 100,000 years ago would have been like, duh, dumbass, of yeah, course. It's ancestral you don't, wisdom. Don't yourself. Yep. So I want to ask and have you walk through the reconciliation of your medical training, potentially your medical peers who were in that old school dogma of low saturated fat, whole grains, jog. I mean, was that challenging for you in terms of, hey, this is kind of my formal training, my textbooks, my professors, this is that one, you know, even though the literature and the and the course that wasn't, you know, very emphasized, my understanding is that the average medical school has four hours of nutrition lecture in that four year curriculum. Was that holding you back or was the result so clear in your own personal N equals one and in your clinical experience treating and prescribing or helping walk people through a low carb intervention and, and, and from your firsthand experience Did that just overpower and just like, Hey, this is a new light. Can you, can you walk us through that? Yeah, it, it did present quite a dilemma uh, because, you know, all doctors, we have 100% intention of doing good of helping people, of, of, of improving disease, of lessening suffering. That's what we're all in this for. And so I had to come face to face with the possibility, number one, that the entirety of modern medicine, when it came to nutri- human nutrition, were just out to lunch. They were just literally didn't know what the hell they were talking about. I had to face that and go, well, dude, you're just this, you're this redneck doctor in this tiny little town in in West Middle Tennessee. Really? You're going to stand up to the entire the entirety of the medical conglomerate super super system and say, nope, you guys all got it wrong. And I figured it out down here in Camden, Tennessee. Because obviously, you know, that that's a bit much to swallow. And secondly, I had to come face to face with the very painful realization that I had caused harm to my own patients in my past medical practice by the recommendations that I had given them. So for the uh, if the past five years before I really kind of uncovered this, every diabetic who I said, I've printed out the American Diabetes Association diet for you. Here you go. You need to follow this as closely as you can. I did harm to that patient. And every patient with hypertension or heart failure that I printed out the American Heart Heart Association's DASH diet and said, here, you need to follow this as closely as you can, I did harm to that patient. I did. Not not intentionally, but the, the net result was I harmed that patient. Every patient that instead of trying to think of a nutritional fix for their problem, I just added another pill. I was contributing to polypharmacy, and and most docs, hopefully most docs know that every time you add a pill to a multi-pill regimen, you don't just double the chances of of having a potential side effect, some of them devastating. It's almost exponential after the the third pill. Every time you add a pill, it's a huge increase in side effect possibility. I harmed those patients. I had diabetics who lost toes and lost uh, legs to their diabetes because of my failing to understand human nutrition. I did that. And unknowingly, yes. But, you know, in in the legal system, it's called involuntary manslaughter. That that don't mean that that you're, you know, not you're you're inculpable. That means you, you are responsible, but you don't get the full penalty of the law. And that's kind of how I looked at that. So that was a a huge stirring in my soul. I had to really come to grips with that. And I had to make a promise to myself that I would spend the entirety of the rest of my medical career trying to do so much good and so much right that was actually good and actually right that it would cancel or atone for my past uh, transgressions. And that's literally before I make every YouTube video, before I ever make a make a TikTok or, or a, a snarky Twitter post, that's always in the back of my mind is I need to post this because people don't know, including doctors and dietitians, maybe this will be the little nudge that they need to go, wait a minute, huh, I've never thought of it that way. And so that that literally is my daily calling is to atone for the damage that I did back when I was a fat, ignorant doctor who didn't know a damn thing about human nutrition. I mean, I mean, one, that's super refreshing and very self-aware in terms of being able to admit that because I don't think a lot of professionals can admit a miseducation or a misapplication of the science at the time, right? So I think one, that's it's awesome to hear that you're really coming full circle. But I think that if you're now fast forwarding 2020, it feels like the tide 
is shifting, no? I mean, I would say that even within the last three to five years, it really seems to, in terms of exponentials, seem to have exponential adoption in terms of mainstream practitioners, at least considering a low-carb intervention as something that's acceptable. I believe the ADA actually finally updated their nutrition guidelines to have low-carb as one of a number of strategies now. So the the tide seems to be turning. Does that is that how you feel from the front lines in terms of being a practicing clinician? Yeah, definitely the tide is turning. Ten years ago, my referral watersheds, the guys that, you know, the endocrinologist and the uh, cardiothoracic surgeons that I would refer my patients to for whatever specific medical problem they had were 100 percent like, what the hell is who's this Barry guy? Why? Why? He told you to eat bacon. What? You know, and so uh, it was 100% pushback 10 years ago. And now it, it even uh, every, every one of them have at least heard of low carb or keto or, or, you know, the banting that they've at least heard of it. And it's not foreign to them, but because 10 years ago it was foreign and, and dangerous. And oh my God, who is this guy? Should I report him to the medical board? It was literally that bad. And now there's much less pushback. And I think that it, 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 that's good, obviously, for the patient's sake. But I think it's bad. It, it's really a bad look for medical professionals because basically they still don't have any, any firsthand knowledge. They still don't, haven't read the low-carb research. They're basically just being pushed over by the, by the mass of bodies who are saying, oh, I'm doing low carb. I'm doing great. I'm not going to change that. So let's not even talk about that. They've heard that so many times that they've basically just given up trying to push back against the low carb paradigm. That's not something for them to be proud of. I'm proud of that because we're basically smothering them with hundreds of thousands of anecdotal cases. You know, after you've seen, if you say one anecdotal case, you're like, hmm, that was weird. I might write that up. But when you've seen 10, you're like, that's Wow, what what's going on? But when you've seen a thousand anecdotal cases, you're like, well, obviously there's this is real. There's something here because I'm not an idiot, and that's what I think. That's what's happening. We're seeing an exponential explosion in the the you know just the case after case after case. And uh, I actually have a fertility doctor who's a hundred percent on board with keto, hundred percent on board with carnivore because in his practice of helping women get pregnant. He has already found it over the last three years much easier to get a woman pregnant if she's eating keto or carnivore. Yeah, endocrinologists are starting to come around. They're very slow because they love all the latest and greatest, uh, you know, diabetic medications, injections, pills, and otherwise. There's even an inhaled insulin now, right? And so that's very sexy to a, an endocrinology nerd. Oh, you're going to inhale the insulin. But they've seen so many of, of low-carb primary care doctors, patients like me, go to them for whatever little insurance reason or whatever. And the patient basically just be like, look, don't talk to me about diet. I'm doing keto. It's working great. My A1C is lower than it's been in 15 years. I stopped all that medicine that you had me on. And I'm never taking that again, just so you know. And I'm also not taking a statin. So so these guys are like, well, but you look great. And your A1C is 5.1 and you've lost 85 pounds. And, and like I said earlier, if they just see one patient like that, they're like, well, that's just a fluke. Duh. Of course, you know, it's anecdotal. But that now they're seeing 20, 50, 100, 500 patients like that. You can't if you if you have any semblance of common sense and just basic logic, you're going to go, maybe there's something to this. And so then you don't push back nearly as hard. Yeah. And I think it's just, it's just actually going back to the roots of science in terms of if your existing framework to explain your observations do not ex- actually explain the observations, it's not because the observations are wrong. It's something that your initial framework or theory are not fitting the actual real world. So I think it's almost asking us to get off the appeal to authority logical fallacy and realizing that I don't think we know the answer today necessarily either, right? Like every single generation thinks that like they kind of are are the smartest generation ever. And that has never been in the case for every previous generation. So I think it is equally foolish to believe that we have it all 100% figured out today. But at least explanations seem to reflect reality and observation in a much broader, much more robust way than the previous explanation. So you mentioned keto, you mentioned carnivore, and I would say that even within the low-carb community, there's 
very interesting substreams or subcultures within within our overall arcing tribe here. So we talked a little bit about ancestral inspiration or, or hypothesis generation in terms of what that ideal diet is. What is the Ken Berry parameters? It sounds like it's sounds like it's pretty open to animal foods. Uh, what can you break this uh, that down for us? Yeah. So I've come more and more to call it the proper human diet, because if you say the K word in many circles, you're immediately judged. Right. And so and then if you say the carnivore diet, people really just make you go wait by the curb, you know, because they're like, what that what? So I've just started calling this the proper human diet. And that's kind of, you know, just the terminology of that's kind of hard to argue with. Like, oh, no, you shouldn't eat the proper human diet. It's dangerous. What? That makes no sense. Right. And so within and I, I don't consider it one specific diet for everyone. I don't I don't think we know enough to, to know that yet. But I do think that we know enough at this point from the smothering weight of the anecdotal cases and evidence and a, an increasing body of low carb evidence that that is very well done science. I think we now can safely say that there definitely is a spectrum of the proper human diet. And on the the far, we'll call it the left end of the spectrum, not for a political reason, but just we got to have a side. It might be full of, of, of green leafy veg, and it might include eggs and lots of seafood, mollusks, crustaceans. It might be a very Mediterranean looking ketogenic diet for many people based on their, their genetic heritage, their uh, current gut bacteria, their current paradigm of how they see the world, that might be the proper human diet for that person. And then we could we could range all the way over until we get to the far right of the proper human diet spectrum, where it would be fatty red meat, salt and water. And that's that in for that specific person is their proper human diet. And I think there's a an infinite number of points in between those two extremes that any human being from anywhere in the world at any age, if you just put them at a random point on the spectrum, they're going to do better on that diet than the modern diet. 100%. But then, and then here comes the biohacking in. Then you get to play around on that spectrum and you get to turn the carbohydrate knob either up or down. You turn the protein knob up or down, the saturated fat. What about this herb? What about this berry? You know, and then you, and so then you start playing on that spectrum, almost like a ham radio operator, just trying to get the perfect frequency and amplitude until you're like, boom, I feel amazing. This is the best weight that I've, I've been at in 20 years. My lab work when I get it checked is pristine. That's the proper human diet for you at that point in time. And so, I mean, it's it's such a freeing way of eating and it's such a liberating way of eating because you get to experiment, dairy or no dairy. You get to experiment spices or no spices, high salt, moderate, low salt. I don't know. I'll try a month of each and see how I feel. And we harken back to that poisoned mammal again, right? If the mammal starts feeling worse, then obviously that's not the, that's not it. That's not what you should be doing. And so then you try a month of, oh, let's try high salt for a month and see if I feel better. Let's add some minerals. Let's, you see what I'm saying? But, and so there's this huge playground on the proper human diet spectrum where you get to play and, and you still have the comfort and, and the just kind of the baseline uh, safety of knowing that you're eating a diet that your ancestors could have absolutely eaten 100,000 years ago. If they lived by the coastline, they could absolutely have lived on clams and, and, and fish and shrimp and then lots of greens from the pasture. Absolutely. There were, we have ample evidence that, that many of our ancestors lived on humongous herbivores and, and drank water and probably had a little bit of plant as an herb or a medicine every now and then, but they lived the majority of their life on a fatty meat diet. So you've got that safety and that foundation to play on as you do your individual biohacking experiments to find out where's the right spot on the spectrum for me personally at this time. Yep. I 100% agree with everything you just stated there in the sense that, and I think this is, again, a point that I feel like is underemphasized within just the nutritional world where there is just personalized preferences and genetic baselines, right? Like my answers 
likely looked and ate different types of nutrition uh, diet than your ancestors and our listeners ancestors and that's perfectly okay that we might have just different various genetic pre predilections in terms of what our body is more adapted towards and then we might have also have different goals right if i'm talking to an Olympic powerlifter, that kind of optimal diet is going to look very different from a startup CEO, from an endurance Ironman athlete to a military operator. So I think, but I think in terms of the overall landscape, I think it's like a pretty interesting way to talk about it in terms of uh, kind of seafood, leafy greens to essentially like a very strict carnivore ruminant diet, which has gotten, you know, some popularity in, in recent year or two. Yeah. And so in that respect, I'm very happy that there are hundreds of, of uh, we'll call them subreddits un, un, within the low carb space, and and a lot of people get very triggered by somebody who they looked up to in the low carb space, but now they've said something that you completely disagree with, and that people get emotional and they're like, no, damn it, I'm not following him or her anymore. Uh, I thought they knew it, they don't know it, you know. And so we got to not do that because we have to remember we are all literally bumbling around, fumbling around in the dark because none of us knows the actual real truth about this. We're rediscovering it. And I think the quickest way to rediscover it and get it set in science so that it'll, it'll never have to be debated again is if we have all these subreddits, you know, oh, honey's fine. No, honey's the devil. Uh, you know, it's okay to have uh, to eat herbs, uh, you know, fresh herbs. Oh, no, they're full of oxalates and phytates. I think all these conversations need to happen in the low carb community because, first of all, I think some people can uh, benefit from one or the other of those things. I think some people will immediately detect inflammation in their eczema getting worse or their whatever if they go down that wrong subreddit. And so the beauty of it is you get to turn around and come back and say, no, that's not that's not for me. I'm going to try this over here. And so I'm happy that there's debate and discussion and disagreement in the low carb community. And I want everybody to stop thinking you've got to pick a side. You don't have to pick a side. All you have to say is, I tried that and it didn't work for me. I tried this and this does work for me. And then we can we can all compare and contrast our experiences as we're bumbling around in the dark together trying to get this this human diet thing figured out. Yep. And then ultimately, I think that's the path to searching for truth, right? Like all of these essentially sellers or explorers going out on the fringes of understanding of human nutrition. And some people might have like a bad experiment. And that's great because that's progress in knowing that this specific diet doesn't work for this specific uh, baseline for that specific goal. And now maybe just like pushing you towards making some like general observations. You know, I personally experimented with carnivore blocks, omnivorous kind of mixed diet that are low carb or ketogenic. I think I've been fortunately lucky not to have any autoimmune issues eating plants or phytonutrients, uh, oxalates, you know, all the kind of anti nutrients that some folks in the carnivore community talk about. It sounds like you've obviously done experimentation for yourself and through your patients as well. I mean, any general broad observations or, or at least like guidance principles for folks who are just listening in? great. There's probably not an ancestral tribe in existence that were vegan, right? Like that probably never existed regardless of what Peter, but regardless of what Peter is trying to push in terms of humans being vegans, that's, I, I would love to see the evidence to, to demonstrate that, but I'm pretty confident there was no consistent ancestral tribe that was hundred percent vegan. Uh, There's just in terms of a couple the, of, of hominid lines way back in our past that we can tell by their teeth, the way their teeth ground down, that they were plant-based. And uh, Dr. Michael Eads talks about this brilliantly in some of his lectures that are on YouTube. And so you see the arrows going, you know, as in the paleoanthropological record. And then here's this guy, and you can tell by his teeth that he just ate plants, and he just had to gnaw on these fibrous plants for hours and hours and hours a day. Well, that line ceased. They're, they're now extinct. And there's two examples of that in the paleoanthropological record. And to my knowledge, I, you know, and I, I, I try to prove myself wrong constantly because I think that's a great exercise, both as a stoic and both as just trying to understand the actual world is, that we're living on. I try to prove myself wrong. And so I've looked and looked for a successful vegan civilization in the past. And, and I, I just can't find it. Uh, I, and, you know, and I've asked this on Twitter multiple times to, and I'll hashtag it vegan plant-based. And I'm like, Hey, I'm reaching out to my vegan friends here. What is there an example in, you know, archeology span or, or uh, just world history of a civilization? 
And it's just crickets chirping. Nobody can come up with that. And you would think that if that were the proper human diet, some civilization would have landed on that at some point, if, if nothing else, by just a random choice and thrived on that diet. And so since that doesn't exist, either in the paleoanthropological record or in archaeology or in, you know, modern world history, I think that's a big red X on the, the vegan diet as a long term diet for human optimization. Yep. I think there are arguments perhaps for ethical or moral reasons, and I think we could probably unpack that. But I think in terms of pure human optimization and, and health and wellness and performance, I yeah, I would say that I'm pretty strongly against the evidence there. It just doesn't exist. But I think it's a fine personal choice from ethical, moral, or religious reasons. But it's a very separate subject than nutrition. Absolutely. And I think it's I think it's a rational choice if you're making the choice from ethical considerations. Because I have a I think everybody has a a line of proximity where they're just not going to eat that. It's just it feels wrong in their heart of hearts, wrong in their soul. They're just not going to do it. So I, I have the I have a line and I suspect you do too. I would I would never eat another Homo sapien sapien. I just would never do that. I would have to be literally on death's door of starvation and and they died of natural causes. And then I might nibble just to keep from dying, but to kill a human and eat them, I would never do that. I would never kill and eat a pri any primate ever, ever. I just would literally starve down to a, to skeletal size before I would eat a primate. I just wouldn't do it. Uh, dolphins are, are, are inside my line I, and not Mahi Mahi. I'm talking about real intelligent dolphins. I just wouldn't eat them. I just would not do it. And so I think I have that line. So I understand that that ethical line, I'm not going to eat on this side of the line, but I'm okay with eating on that side of the line. Vegans, they just have a, their lines at a different place. And, the, and, and that's why, I, again, I, I think that they are looking for the proper human diet, just like we are, but they're no, nowhere close to us in their current investigation. And I don't mean they're behind us. I mean, they're just at a different place right now. And so I try to get everybody to not be disrespectful and condescending to people who currently believe that a plant-based diet is, is the best diet for human beings. I give them credit for at least knowing their ethics and their morals. And also, of, they're at least looking. They're at least trying to figure out this nutrition conundrum that we've all presented with at birth. Yep. Yeah, I think that's well articulated. Yeah, and I think on the ethical or moral line, I think that's what has made me a lot more interested in hunting and actually, you know, basically killing and, and, and butchering and, and, and salvaging animal meat that I'm going to be eating, right? Because I think that is kind of the line that we are complicit on. If I'm okay to have, you know, McDonald's kill the animal for me, then I should be able to take that, taking a life of another you know, a mammal with a with a brain with potential low levels of cognition and be able to take that and, and live with that and sleep with that. So I think that's made me realize the magnitude of the choices of our of our nutrition. And I think it's for me, it's like, okay, if I'm gonna live this way, then I should actually like be a part of the 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 consequences of that choice. So that's where I've been taking and I think it's like a good articulation of yeah, I haven't, you know, explicitly thought like, would I eat a human being? Like, it's like basically, yeah. If I'm gonna die otherwise, then it's like probably there is some level of self-preservation for yourself as an individual. But hey, if I have an option to eat a hamburger versus a Homo sapien burger, yeah, that would be. Uh... Again, I don't think there's a judgment for me per se in terms of like, is there a universal ethic to like not eat a Homo sapien? But I think just from a like a like a human societal camaraderie level, yeah, like let's not kill other humans to go eat them. That's pretty. That's pretty brutal. <laughs> yeah, and so you remember earlier I said that that on the left hand spectrum of the proper human diet, it could be plant rich with some seafood, right, and some and and some eggs maybe. And so what I, what I'm trying to do is to help vegans understand. This this ethical line, and if and I if if a vegan said, look, I I don't care what you say, Doctor Barry, I could never eat another mammal. I would say, cool, brother, sister, put your put your ethical line right there. I think that's that's fine. Never eat another mammal, and so that and you see what that's going to do. That's going to leave them with a rich cornucopia of of fat and protein sources in the animal kingdom. 
but but they're not eating the soft and cuddly mammals that have mamas and that nurse at mama's breast. You see, and and so if we could help them move their ethical line just to just a wee bit, so that they could include mollusks or and and eggs, you know, poultry, not mammals. Uh, a, a mother chicken will if she gets hungry, she'll eat one of her chicks. She doesn't care. She's she's a velociraptor with feathers. Literally, chickens don't care. They, if you die in the chicken pen, they'll eat you. They do not care. And people don't realize the, the difference in, in, in animals like that. And so if you want to put your ethical line at, at the, the mammalian border, I totally respect that. And I get that. And if that's what helps you sleep at night, then fine, put your line there. But you've got to eat animals, any part of the proper human diet. If you're not getting animal sourced protein and animal sourced fat, you're never going to realize your optimal health. 100%, 100%. So, yeah, going back to the original question, I mean, are there some general principles or guidelines that you found work for yourself that you like in terms of your experimentation? I mean, just to, at least to help people guide it with their experimentation. What are some of like the most common paths you see to be successful? Yeah. So there are, there are several things you just need to get completely out of your diet and give up on. They are modern mass marketed slow poisons and those include sugar both added and natural occurring sugar. Uh, that includes all the grains, every grain, including quinoa. Sorry, Lauren Cordain, but get the quinoa out. Uh, for most people, any tuber, any underground vegetable is going to be too starchy. Starch, if you don't know, is just long chains of glucose molecules holding hands. And then to get rid of all of the vegetable oils. Those three things, I think if we, if we could, if you and I could be co-dictators and just say, from this day forward, it, you will be executed if you eat any sugar, any grains, or any vegetable seed oils. I think that the health of the country would just skyrocket. The, the rates of type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, obesity, all the chronic conditions would plummet just from those three changes alone. And then add some kind of fatty meat to your diet. Stop being afraid of saturated fat. And so for me, I, I, and also I look at it as a carbohydrate knob, just like the knob on a stereo for the volume. Some people can eat 100 total grams a day and do great, perfect. Some people have to turn it down to 50. Some have to turn it down to 20. Some like me, if, if they want to feel the best they can feel and look the best they can look, they have to turn that carbohydrate intake knob as close to zero as they can get it. And that's where they do their best. And so when you think about a carbohydrate knob, and so at any point you can you can change the volume of your carbohydrate intake, get rid of the three poisons that are just with I don't think I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I think even Joel Kahn, a, a, he's a vegan cardiologist, I think he would agree. Yeah, you probably need to just get those three things out of your diet. And then you're left with what you're left with, then you get to play around. But for me personally, Keto improved everything by 80% versus me eating the American Diabetes Association diet. Every single malady that I had got 80% better. Some went completely away, but but the, but the heartburn was the worst of all for me. Back when I was fat and ignorant, I took two Nexium every day, two Nexium, and then still had Tums and some apple cider vinegar. Constant heartburn, severe 10 out of 10 pain. I uh, would have the nurses hook me up and do an EKG to make sure I wasn't having a heart attack. That's how bad it hurt. 80% better on keto, which that's awesome. If anybody's ever had chronic severe reflux, that's huge. And so I, I saw this crazy Sean Baker dude talking about the carnivore diet. And, and so I, I got on my Facebook page and I said, hey, guys, let's do a month of just carnivore. Let's just try it and see what happens. And it was just, a you know, just a, uh, an experiment. So probably two or 300 people and me did this. And at the end of that month, I, it occurred to me, I haven't had heart, heartburn a single time this month, which was, I mean, that's miraculous compared to how I used to be. And uh, my rosacea, which I used to have to put hydrocortisone ointment on at least two or three times a week to kind of keep it at bay so it wasn't so glaringly obvious. Uh, people out there, don't put steroid on your face. It's bad, but I'm a doctor, so I felt like I knew better. And so I was able to titrate it without going overboard. But I didn't, it was gone. Literally, it's like, I don't have that anymore. Uh, the the joint pain that was 80% better was now completely gone. I'm currently 51, will be 52 in December. I feel better now at 51, that literally, and I'm not even uh, fudging. I feel better at 51 than I felt at 35, way better. 
I perform better. Literally no no pain. I'm standing here right now. Yesterday, I jumped off a retaining wall and landed. There was some rebar sticking up out of the ground and went through my shoe and into my foot. So I've got some pain in my left foot currently from, from that trauma. But otherwise, I literally am pain-free, which I think the average 51-year-old would be shocked to hear a 51-year-old say, I have zero pain in my body on a daily basis. Not just, oh, I had a good day. But I have zero pain in my body unless, you know, I jump onto some rebar or something. Then I have some pain for a few days. Yeah, that's an interesting point, which is that I feel like in a previous generation, it's like, oh, I have all these pains and you're 50. It's like, okay, you're just old. And I think folks like yourself, I I think people like Joe Rogan, some of these folks that are just at the edge of human performance, they're in their 50s. And they're saying they're feeling great. And I think that that's the level of standard that we should be aiming for. Like, why resign ourselves towards a slow, morbid phase of life when we're in essentially what could be like a mid midpoint. And I think that's where I know like our listeners, I think are more attuned and enlightened on this path and are already, I would say on the more experimental side, but we need to take this message out to everyone in America. And I think that I'm curious to get your thoughts as we extrapolate out a little bit more I mean, a lot of the comorbidities associated with COVID, which is on top on top of everyone's mind, are associated with a lot of the problems that you just described, a lot of the processed foods that trigger uh, hyperinsulinemia, metabolic syndrome. Maybe to expand out the, our purview here, here a little bit, love to hear your thoughts on kind of the general chronic conditions of Americans today in modern civilization. And then two, in terms of your carnivore experiment, yeah, I'm curious to hear about what you think are the mechanisms that took your carnivore experience be, uh, as, as a superior or better intervention than just a standard mixed diet, uh, ketogenic diet? For me personally, I did not see a material difference from carnivore or a mixed diet keto, although I thought a carnivore diet was very, very palatable and very, very doable. I enjoyed it. But, you know, I, I actually kind of like the, the variety of, of, of having a little bit of spinach and a tomato or something. So curious to hear about that carnivore experiment and then zoom out towards broader chronic state of, of humans today in America. Yeah. And I'm not, obviously we don't know why, why I feel so good and do so good on a carnivore diet. It could be phytates. It could be lectins. It could be salicylates. I've, I just recorded a, a YouTube video this morning. I'm going to post it after this about salicylates and, and eczema and asthma and nasal polyps and allergic rhinitis. It's huge. And, and 52% of people with eczema are salicylate intolerant. But I guarantee you the majority of people with eczema, their doctor has never said, hey, have you ever tried a month of just avoiding fruits and vegetables that are high in salicylates? Never. They've just said, hey, there's this new really high copay uh, steroid cream. Try this and see how this works. I'll write you a prescription. So I think that we don't know all the reasons. I think there are multiple compounds in, in plants that for some of us have dastardly effects for some of us lead to to mild to moderate inflammation in some part in our body. And then for some people, maybe like you, they don't seemingly have any kind of inflammation whatsoever from eating that that fruit or veg. Uh, And so I I think that's that that needs to be discussed. And you need to come to the table and say, hey, man, I eat tomatoes and watercress every day and I feel amazing. So How's that possible when every time Dr. Barry eats a nightshade, regardless of which one, he bloats up and gains three pounds and, and, you know, and has stinky farts for three days? How's that? How do we make that make sense? And so I think that that's the kind of conversation that needs to be happening diplomatically and lovingly in the low carbohydrate community, because that's the only way we're either going to figure out what is the diet or is it? Yeah, no, it's a spectrum. Everybody gets to kind of pick on this spectrum. The, as far as the chronic disease thing, it's, yeah, I literally think that the two paradigms help you understand it completely. First of all is the slow poisoning paradigm. Sugar and grains and industrial vegetable oils, they don't kill you today or tomorrow. There's never, you know, there's not going to be a class action lawsuit because canola oil killed a hundred thousand people yesterday. That's never going to happen, but they are slow inflammatory poisons. And so they're very insidious and the, the damage and the inflammation adds up over time. Now, back to our biohacking, if I took the average American who's eating, you know, eating at uh, McWindy King's 10 times a week and said, hey, you should try 
some some DHEA and you should try and you should take 5,000 units of vitamin D a day. That, that'd be a biohack, right? We'd be like, I think you'll feel better. Well, that's like telling a, an alcoholic, hey, I think if you'll if you'll take some Aussie berry every day, you won't feel as terrible. That's ridiculous. And so that's that's why I think sometimes us biohackers, we get so myopic looking at, no, this, look at the mechanism of this. This is going to help everything. But you're ignoring this huge, slow poisoning event that's happening to you every day because you're eating shit. I think that's like, actually, let's linger on this point, which I think is a very good point where I think a lot of the folks on the very edge are so obsessed with like the latest, coolest toy of like this supplement or this intervention. It's like, wait, can you just do the fundamentals? Like if you actually just eat, like you know, avoid the slow poisons, right? I think is a, uh, which I think is a very good way to articulate it. Sleep well, do some reasonable exercise, get some sun, don't do stupid stuff. That's 90% of it. And then let's talk about sauna, nootropics, ketones, whatever crazy, you know, brainwave thingy mabobber that people are playing around with. I, like, I think that's like a good point to just linger on. Cause I think, I think, you know, I'm sure you get access to a lot of little tool toys. And it's like, those are the things that people like talk to talk about, but, and it's sexy cause it's new and it's cool, but Hey, make sure to do the basics. Exactly. And that's exactly what I counsel people. Let's take, let's take care of the 90%. And so, you know, it's kind of like a modified Pareto principle. Let's let's do the simple things that are going to give you 90% of the benefit. And then if you want to go over here and spend $1,000 on some kind of red light bullshit, knock yourself out. That's fine. But do not hinge all your hope on this $1,000 red, you know, red LED light thing. That ain't going to fix everything. But and so, you know, I could just see the bio, this biohacker living in his mom's basement, living on Twinkies and honey buns. And he, and he you know, steals mom's credit card and gets a thousand dollar infrared light and he stands naked in the bathroom in, in front of this light. And then he's taking some great nootropic that's brand new and costs five hundred dollars a month. And he's like, well, this shit don't work. Dude, you're completely ignoring the 90 percent. You're over here focused on this maybe 1%, maybe one-tenth of 1% and spending all your time and energy and money here and you're completely ignoring the foundation of your health. You're, you're busy worried about putting this little uh, wind, wind vane on top of your house and you ain't even poured the damn foundation yet. You got it backwards. Yeah. And I think especially knowing folks in Silicon Valley, you're describing some friends and I, I mean in the most enduring way that I think they don't necessarily aren't the, like the most healthy looking folks. They're probably unfriend their computer too much and have a, a, too much disposable income to buy those toys. But like, it's exactly what you're describing, right? It's like, yeah, you're, you're doing the wind, wind vane, but you forgot like the basics. Yeah. I, I interrupted you there in terms of just as we're zooming out to in terms of just chronic health. And I think the, the slow poison, uh, making sure we get to the foundations, I interrupted your flow there. No worry. No worries. So the second paradigm that we, if, once you understand this, it really makes a lot of things fall into place is the addiction model. And when you start thinking of definitely sugar and very possibly grains and just processed ground up carbohydrates in general, when you and, and then fruit juices, soft drinks, everything that's that's high in carbohydrates, when you start to understand that those trigger dopamine receptors in your nucleus accumbens just exactly like addictive substances do. When you have a, a PET scan of both brains, it's hard to tell which one's the cocaine and which one's the honey bun, literally, because they're they're lighting up the same dopamine neurons. When you understand that, and then when you're like, yeah, but I miss whatever. Yeah, that's addiction talking. And that that addiction model also helps uh, helps you understand the keto flu. And I, I hate that term because what it, what it actually is, is carbohydrate withdrawal. That's what you're going through. When a, when a smoker quits smoking, they feel like shit for three to 10 days. Is that, is that keto flu? Or is, uh, I mean, should they go back to smoking? Because obviously being a non-smoker is dangerous because look how terrible you feel. No, they should definitely not go back to smoking because on the other side of that three to 10 day addiction breaking cycle is good health. 
That's why they're quitting smoking. The same goes for an alcoholic. Same goes for any drug of abuse. The same goes for definitely processed carbohydrates. But I think for some of us, too much of any carbohydrate has a certain addictive potential because it really lights lights up our dopamine receptors. And I think that's been bred into us over the eons because anytime you found a honey tree 100,000 years ago, you were going to endure the stings and you were going to eat all that honey. Anytime the fruit or the berries got ripe, you would run the grizzly bear off so you could eat the berries and the, and the fruit because you needed that to gain 5 to 20 pounds of fat so you didn't starve to death in the winter because you never knew when you were not going to have access to any food for a month. And so if you could hold 10, 20 pounds of excess stored energy, which is fat, then yeah. And so I think that our taste buds now in this never ending fall that we all live in where there's, you know, there's always avocado, there's always papaya, there's always blueberries, 24, 7, 365. Our, our, our instinct of the past is now crippling us because we're like, no, fruit is good for you. Maybe for some of us, but for some of us, fruit is the devil. And I'm sorry, you know, forgive me. But for some of us, eating fruit on a daily basis is a recipe for chronic inflammation and obesity. Yeah. And if you actually look at modern fruit, these are Frankenstein versions of what was ancestrally in nature, right? Like these are plump sugar bombs of fruits that have been cultivated for maximum delicious and delight with like minimal seeds. So it's it's actually interesting when people say, hey, plants and fruits are, are very natural. It's evolutionarily consistent. It's like, well, show me that like red, beautiful gala apple that existed 100,000 years ago. That thing did not exist. So I think that's a, a good point to just when people go towards like the naturalistic fallacy, you know, where does that come from? I'm curious in terms of where you're looking in terms of, and I know you, you are, you know, written a book in terms of talking about kind of the chronic disease cases. Um, as we're moving more towards nutrition, I mean, how does the healthcare system and incentive payer payee practitioner or payer structure need to evolve. I mean, I, I think that's like, you know, me as a, a business person I, and, a, and an engineer, I always think about incentives and and, and make, sh- make sure the incentives actually align towards a result and a strategy that actually works. Because uh, I think every single person that's an existing doctor and an existing hospital administrator and insurance provider, I think they're good people. I don't think they're just trying to like screw people over. But I think the incentive structure is not perfect. Do you have some thoughts in that direction in terms of, okay, you know, you, you obviously, you know, you're, you're a doctor, you, you, this is like how you bill and make a living. How would you restructure an incentive system? Yeah. And that's a, a compelling question. And my answer may surprise you and may worry some people. I don't think you can restructure it. I think that, uh, it's, it, it's very, akin to when the incandescent light bulb came along and you were a candle maker. I think it, it, when you, you were the guy who shoot all the horses in town and now Henry Ford's got a a Ford dealership in town. I think that many, many healthcare providers, when, when this does become mainstream, and I don't think it's anywhere close to mainstream yet, we're definitely picking up steam but we're nowhere close to a tipping point where this is just known that a low carb diet is the healthiest diet for humans. When that happens, uh, there are going to be endocrinologists who are seeing three patients a week. And there are going to be orthopedic surgeons whose only cases are trauma because there are no diabetic toes and legs and feet. There is no Charcot foot. There is none of that stuff. And and there will, there will be rheumatologists who see three people a month because that's how many people will have rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or fibromyalgia. These things will just literally stop happening. And so there will be many, many healthcare providers who will either retire or they'll adapt because you know the the mantra adapt or die. I think that's 100%. And most doctors are by definition smart guys or gals, and they're also uh, hopefully lifelong students. So it should not be a starvation level event for them. They should be able to adapt and find something else to apply their IQ to. Because when this becomes mainstream, I'm just telling you, there's just not going to be the demand for healthcare that there was. And when you add to that, the growing dissatisfaction that the average person 
has for healthcare. And the, the whole COVID-19 debacle has, I think, really intensified that. People just are literally, they don't trust anything that anybody wearing a white coat says anymore. There is a growing subset of people who, if, if, if somebody's got a white coat on and a stethoscope around their neck, they definitely ain't listening to that guy. And that's a, that's a growing paradigm. And I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just saying that's that's becoming a big, big percentage of the population. And so when you when you combine improving chronic disease to such an extent in so many people that there's just nobody that needed to see the doctor today, except that one guy that jumped off the retaining wall and landed on a piece of rebar like a moron, you'd have to see him give him a tetanus shot. But that's it. That'd be your only patient. I mean, you're going to have to do something, right? And then you've got this other huge percentage of the population who doesn't trust anything a doctor says about anything because of just the, the multiple fumbles in this whole COVID thing. I think, I think that there's, it's, there's probably going to be some kind of catastrophic change in the way that healthcare is delivered in modern society. And I, I have no idea what that's going to look like. I don't think we ever know until the day it happens. But I, I, I don't see a way around that because never, never do I envision the American Diabetes Association holding a press conference and saying, you know, for the last 70 years, we've been telling you guys to eat lots of whole grain and honey's fine. And, you know, you can have has, and as many carbs as you want, just match your insulin to the carbs. And, oh, here's this recipe for apple crisp strudel on our website. I don't think they're ever going to hold a press conference and say, you know, we're morons. We got all of that wrong, and we are very sorry. We're going to give all your donations back because we obviously don't know what the hell we're talking about when it comes to helping diabetics keep their kidneys and their retinas and their toes and their feet. That's never going to happen. So I think this has to be, by definition, a groundswell, a grassroots movement. And anytime you have a grassroots movement that grows exponentially and makes sense and is sustainable, there's always a revolutionary fall at some point when in, in all of human history, when you see a grassroots movement that can't be stopped, there's a revolution or there's some sort of collapse at some point in the future. And so I'm not hoping for that. I'm not predicting that. But I'm, I'm just saying that me personally, I've looked at this from many different angles circumspectly, and I don't see a way that we can just tinker with the, the the current healthcare delivery system and say, oh, okay, there we go. We fixed it. Now everybody can eat low carb and all these hundreds of thousands of doctors can still drive their BMWs. I don't see how that's going to work. Yeah. I, I think people have started leaning towards that direction, but I don't have, I have not heard someone articulate it. So maybe bluntly or, or directly, which I think is like a reasonable path or like a, like a, like a potentially realistic path in how this thing shakes out. I mean, if you look at innovation cycles and new technologies, new, new paradigms, there is some level of creative destruction. And I don't think it's necessarily bad, right? It's like the horse industry, obviously a lot of people lost their jobs, they, but we are resilient as a people, as a culture, and we'll readapt. I think we have to be optimistic in that way, right? We cannot say, hey, uh, we're going to lose some jobs and people are going to have some livelihood struggle. Therefore, we're going to continue to be in the stone ages in terms of our understanding of nutrition and healthcare. That's not going to be the winning solution either, right? Like a smarter, more future forward thinking society will beat us in terms of competitiveness if we all become chronically diabetic, overweight, obese civilization. And I think that's one of the most interesting conversations I've had with some folks in the military where you can't get enough people even to go into service because they're like a lot of kids are just overweight and, and obese. And if we cannot even be healthy where we're killing ourselves, how can we even be a strong culture, a strong nation? Exactly right. I, and I think that's a very valid question that needs to be answered at some point. But I just hope, I, I hope, truly hope that my healthcare delivery colleagues have read some Marcus Aurelius and, and they're able to say when this happens, it's good that that happened because now this is going to make me grow. I'm going to have to I'm going to have to find something else to do. Or I'm going to have to be more creative. So I hope that they're they're applying a stoic philosophy. You know, go read some Ryan Holiday healthcare providers if you're watching this because you're going to need it. I promise. I don't know if it's 5 years or 50 years, but it's going to happen where you're going to have to be fully prepared to say it's good that I just went bankrupt because I'm only seeing three patients uh, a week. 
now I get to grow. And th- that's going to help your, your mental, mental health greatly if you can look at it that way. Yeah, no, that's interesting in terms of stoicism. I'm curious in terms of the philosophical aspect. I mean, what brought you to stoicism? I feel like in the modern age, we seem to not care as much about history or these more classical philosophies. It feels like we are worshiping the athletes and the rappers and the and, and, and the Instagram social media stars. What brought you down the philosophical path? I'm not sure what started it. I think growing up, my father is an engineer and he had a bookshelf of just, you know, technical drawing and engineering, civil engineering. And I was forbidden to touch these books. And so obviously being a good active boy like I am, as soon as I caught nobody looking, I immediately looked at all the books. And so for growing up, it was almost as if that level of knowledge was forbidden fruit. And so that made me want it even more. And so this is the guy that was reading Aristotle and Ayn Rand when I was 13 and 14 years old. So I, I'm probably not a standard case, but uh, I think I think that understanding the Stoic philosophy and, and applying that to any degree in your life is going to help you have a much happier life, much more productive life and a much more successful life. Even if, even if all the success you, you ever have is understanding that what you have is enough. Yeah. Another way I think about it is that life is too short to learn all the hard lessons in our actual lifetime. Why not read about Marcus Aurelius and and the pain and the, and the stress of of the Roman Empire falling because of, of, of barbarian invasions, right? And I think hopefully we don't ever have to face a problem, a challenge that drastic. But I mean, we're living through a pandemic right now. There's going to be a pretty raucous election in a, in a, in a few weeks now. And uh, I think it's worth looking at some of the literature to at least help couch the era of our lifetime in a broader, more historic global context in the sense that like, okay, at least we're not getting invaded <laughs> by barbarians to that level. Not to say that our, our challenges are not dire for ourselves, but I think that 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 perspective is valuable. Oh, I totally agree. So the last topic that I want to cover as we wrap up here is... I think this interesting rejection of traditional bastions of authority, and I think I used to be much more attuned towards the authoritative, like the scientists are right, why aren't we listening to the scientists? But I think just recently, just with the flip-flops from masks, no masks, like from masks or security theater, to now no, everyone should be wearing masks, to now potentially vaccines seeming being politicized, and I think, gener- of course, like I think we're not talking anti-vax here. I'm talking specifically on the COVID-19 vaccine where like a lot of these interventions are, I mean, just longitudinally, just there's not literally not that much time that these are in humans. And we're potentially pushing this up because we wanted to, to fit behind some election cycle. I think there's reasonable questions that people are asking saying like, hey, this is weird. Like, this doesn't feel like science and rationality. This feels like this is very corrupted by politics or finances or money. How do we solve this? Like, does this mean that we need to rebuild our institutions, our, our, our bastions of authority? Does it mean, hey, like, like how, how do we resolve this? I mean, this is, I think this is a challenge of our time. Again, a very con- compelling question. I don't, obviously, I don't even pretend to have the answer for that. But I, what I would say is that if, if each of us individually is resilient enough, is prepared enough, is anti-fragile enough, if we're able to take care of ourselves, if we're able to take care of our family, if we're able to take care of our neighbor, then the world's not going to end, right? And so I, I agree with you that the the ivory towers of nutrition, of medicine, of politics, God forbid, of basically any you know upper level thought process right now, all of these ivory towers are full of corruption, no doubt. Because we're all human beings, we all want to get ahead. So yeah, it's, they're going to take the bribe. That's just human nature. Uh, I think. They're, but the the more disappointing thing, because you you said earlier, you know, every every generation thinks they're the most modern and the most awake and the most up to date. And this that this generation that that currently resides in the ivory towers of whatever intellectual uh, academic you know uh, flavor that you want to talk about. The sad thing is that they're full of myth and they're full of fads. And that's the thing that really makes me sad 
is that it's very disappointing, you know, because I could see them thinking, no, we've got the latest and greatest. This thing floats. This thing's invisible. That's that's all great. But when you literally are promoting to the masses a complete and utter untested fad diet, and, and you have not only staked your reputation on that, but you have made your fortune on that. How do you how do you fix that? And, and you know, there's the old quote that science proceeds one death at a time. Uh, and that doesn't mean go out and kill people in the ivory towers, folks. Calm down. That just means that as the old gray haired uh, gentlemen and gentlewomen who are currently in charge as they pass away, then the next generation gets to come in and say, yeah, all that stuff was horse crap. That, we just we just nodded and smiled because, you know, Dr. McGillicuddy was chairman of the department, but he's dead now. And so we're not going to talk about that foolishness anymore because we all know that's foolishness. That's typically how, you know, it, it changes in, in academic settings. I feel like that this groundswell of the low carb keto, ketovore, carnivore, that thing, what and I call it the proper human diet, but whatever you want to call it, that thing is growing so fast and becoming so big and becoming so undeniable. I mean, at this point, yeah, you maybe just saw the article where uh, it was in the beat where they said, oh, and The Beat is a vegan magazine. And they were talking about this new research that showed that long-term keto was very unhealthy. And actually, there's no re- new research whatsoever. They just went back and did a little analysis on research that was done years ago. And that wasn't. there's no low-carb option in any of the, the, the cohorts that they looked at. The low-carb option is like less than 45% carbohydrate. There is no keto option. They, there was no keto people to study back then. But yet they've got this article out there. And, and I've had multiple people reach out to me and say, oh, my God, is keto bad long term? I thought it was safe. But this and so that's what they've staked that they're literally staking their reputation on that house of sand. And I just feel like this this proper human diet movement is just going to wash all of that bullshit away. And I don't know what's going to happen to all those professors who have staked their reputation and their fortune on a high carbohydrate, saturated, fat-free diet. I don't know what they're going to do. Maybe they can start making candles or start making wagon wheels because I don't think they're going to be able to make much money peddling a high carbohydrate diet anymore. Roger that. And I think I think that's why these long-form conversations, I think, help where we're able to actually have like a reasonable discussion around the pros and cons and some of the subtleties. And I think that hopefully, and, I, and it feels like there's just more attention towards that. Like I know that your following has grown substantially over the years as well, where I think people are realizing and observing and being their own scientists to actually collect their own data to realize that, hey, this ex- this experiment, which is a, a valid N equals one self-run study is a better potential approximation of reality than what might be pushed by dogma in the past. So keep up the good fight. I mean, I think this was a really fun conversation. I love that we were able to cross a number of topics. So for my listeners who aren't aware of all the stuff that you have going on, what does the rest of 2020 look for you? What are your channels? Uh, what are your upcoming projects? So um, I, I try to post at least three new videos on my YouTube channel every week, and they cover a wide spectrum of medical and nutrition. I stay away from politics, and but but medicine and nutrition are fair game. Anything in those two realms. I'm, uh, I've got the book, Lies My Doctor Told Me, that you can get anywhere. It's also an audible. Uh, and I'm working on a book now called The Proper Human Diet. So I'm going to try to Put that in in black and white. What I what we talked about today. Making YouTube videos. You know, I'm, I'm doing interviews and podcasts. I, at least once a week, I try to interview somebody who's smarter than me, which is not hard to find people like that on my YouTube channel. And I've got a bunch of interviews with people like Nina Teicholtz. And uh, gosh, the list goes on and on and on and on. And so there, there, I try to. I'm trying to make artifacts. As uh, Bucky Fuller used to say, every day you need to make artifacts that the future is going to find and benefit from. And so that's what I try to do is I, every day I try to put artifacts out there that are going to help people improve their nutrition, improve their health, both physical and mental. Right. Both are important. And I want to help people improve both, improve their health span, improve their lifespan and 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 develop their bullshit meter to the point where they just don't fall for a new article in the beat. 100%. I, I love the refreshing voice. 
everyone, tune in, follow Ken. It's it, This is great. Dr. Barry, thanks so much for taking the time. We'll have so to have you back on soon when the book comes out. Yeah, thanks a lot, brother. Cheers.